Hello, and thanks for watching. This is Professor Paul, and this is a short lecture on uh, modeling how to get started in a research project. So, starting with an overview, uh, I'm going to give you an example of how you might start investigating a topic, how to generate some basic questions and search terms to use as you look for sources, um, the kinds of things that are available, some basic sources that are available uh, through the internet and how you would evaluate those and identify key ideas. And here we're just going to be working with sort of introductory level sources, just getting your uh, feet wet, so to speak, getting the lay of the land when it comes to understanding the breadth of your topic. And then I'll end by talking about how you can develop an outline, um, organizing ideas and sources uh, and give you an example of that. So I decided to pick for the topic that I wanted to investigate here um, something that's called the Dunning-Kruger effect, which is a uh, psychological theory that I've heard about and seems interesting to me. And what I know about it, what I, my understanding of it, is that the Dunning-Kruger effect is the name for a phenomenon when people who uh, are unskilled at a particular activity, they're incompetent or they're unskilled, that is, they just don't know how to do something, they often overestimate their... Um, their ability, they mistakenly think that they are extremely skilled or experts. And um, building on this, I have my understanding is that the more, the, some, oftentimes the less skilled you are, the more you overestimate your skill. So this seems like an interesting topic to me, and that's where I'm starting when it comes to research. So in terms of generating questions, just general uh, uh, categories, of course, that you might use when you're generating questions on this or, or any topic, um, things like the history, looking for important figures, looking up technical terms, specific vocabulary, asking about or trying to find out and discover uh, debates and controversies having to do with the topic. These are, again, just some of the basic general topics that you might um, ask about anything. Uh, and uh, depending on the subject that you're investigating, you would get more specific based on these kinds of categories. So based on those categories, these are a few of the many questions that someone might um, ask if they wanted to research this topic. Uh, who developed the theory of the Dunning-Kruger effect? That is, who's Dunning-Kruger? Is it one person or is it a person named Dunning and a person named Kruger? Um, and when I say who developed the theory, I don't just mean what are their names, but uh, what other work have they done? What fields are they in? What other kinds of ideas have they proposed? Uh, in terms of understanding the history, when was the theory first proposed and how was it discovered and tested? What was the evidence that they used to put this theory together and that supports it? So that's kind of just understanding the history and the development. Um, thinking about terms, how do we define intelligence or competence or skill? What does it actually mean to say that someone is skilled at something or competent at something? Um, these seem like very vague and relative terms. So how do they actually define them in making their measurements and making their uh, uh, estimations? And how can you tell if you're experiencing the Dunning-Kruger effect? It seems like sort of a paradox in the sense that if you're unskilled at something, you think that you're very skilled, but if you're skilled at something, you would also think that you're very skilled. So how, how do you know if you are skilled or unskilled? How do you know if you're overestimating your abilities? And finally, related concepts. What related concepts might we want to uh, investigate? What are ideas that uh, you need to understand in order to understand the Dunning-Kruger uh, effect? So first steps, just wanting to find background information. So um, you could use Google or any other public internet uh, search engine. Um, and here we're just looking for basic research materials, uh, background info. As I said, the idea is to get the lay of the land, get a sense of how broad the topic is. So at this stage, if all I know about the Dunning-Kruger effect is, is what I've um, detailed in the last couple slides, there's a lot that I need to discover. Uh, but as I pursue my research topic, that doesn't mean that I use, necessarily cite everything that I find. And oftentimes early in the research process, the sources that you find, they might help you understand your, your 
your subject better, uh, but they won't necessarily make it to your final paper. They might be things that lead you to other more substantial or more informative sources, things that uh, will help you make a more complex um, uh, presentation of your ideas. So search terms, what do you actually plug into Google or Bing or uh, the library database? What are the words, phrases that you plug in uh, besides the name of the topic that you're researching? I could just put in Dunning-Kruger, but that will not give me uh, the most refined search. That'll just give me everything. If I want to find more specific information, I need to refine my search by adding different keywords. And here I've just got some very basic keywords, Dunning-Kruger plus history, Dunning-Kruger plus controversy, Dunning-Kruger plus development plus evidence. These are search terms that you could use with any topic, really. Um, although here using them for, for Dunning-Kruger, they'll help me to narrow down. Dunning-Kruger plus history will help me find articles that are related to the history of this uh, theory. Dunning-Kruger plus controversy might uh, help me find things about current debates, challenges to the theory, etc. So um, this is these are just a few of the practically infinite combinations of terms that you might use to find sources. Uh, but again, the idea here is uh, think about what you want to discover and what you're asking about and use terms from those questions to help you generate your combinations, your search combos. So initially, uh, and I'm not going to show you the whole process of going through Google and searching through the first couple pages uh, of Google to find sources, but I put in Dunning-Kruger effect and as a, just a brief overview, some sources that I found, I found of course the Wikipedia entry as well as a few other online encyclopedia entries, uh, many news articles from sources like Forbes, The Washington Post, Salon, The Atlantic, um, NPR, uh, all sorts of things like that, all sorts of different, different uh, news sources. I found articles from popular science publications like Psychology Today, um, Ars Technica, Nature, things like that. Um, and I found, of course, many uh, uh, personal sites, people with various blogs, some of whom are professionals in the field discussing their, uh, their attitudes or their understanding of this theory. So I found a pretty wide range of things. And I also found some scholarly articles uh, related to this, that is things published and written not for a general audience, not for uh, people who aren't specialists, but written for people who specifically study these kinds of issues. So I did find some scholarly articles, but of course the library database is where I'd go if I really wanted to focus on that area. So what can I use? What are the kinds of things I can get from the Wikipedia, other encyclopedia entries, from news articles, from popular science publications? How do I evaluate these? How do I choose between all sorts of different sources? What information am I looking for? That's what I'll talk about over the next couple slides. So sources like Wikipedia and other internet encyclopedia, uh, they often are quite useful. Um, and you should use them when it comes to finding basic information. Again, getting the lay of the land, understanding the broad topic or the broad range of your topic, all the different things that you might be interested in researching. Uh, and they usually are reliable, um, uh, although not entirely so and not in all cases. But these sources are often pretty reliable when it comes to basic facts and simple issues. That is, things that can generally be cross-checked, verified with other sources. So while you probably, and you actually you should, shouldn't, uh, use Wikipedia or other internet encyclopedia as sources, especially at the level of a, a college paper or above, um, they can help provide you with information to get started and point you into areas, other areas that will be more fruitful and to other sources that will be more fruitful for your research. So news and general readership articles, uh, by which I mean things like 
uh, anything from MSNBC, CBS, NPR, The Atlantic, Time Magazine, websites for news channels, websites for, for newspapers, um, things that are written that cover a wide range of topics from all aspects of society and write for a mass audience. Uh, they will, when presenting scientific ideas and complex issues, they will simplify uh, because they have a small word count. They have they write tend to write short articles, and they're writing for people who aren't specialists, who aren't experts. So they have to simplify complex ideas for the general readership. Uh, and in doing so, you lose detail, you lose nuance, and sometimes you actually get misinformation. Uh, but these can again provide you with a good background. They often will relate their ideas to current events. So as you'll see in some of the sources that I found, um, there were attempts to link the idea of the Dunning-Kruger effect to current political ideas or the, to the current political climate. Um, and most sources will cover the same information. If you have an article on a specific um, topic or event from NBC, CBS, ABC, CNN, uh, the Atlantic, whatever, all these different sources, it'll, they'll generally all cover roughly the same information with maybe a few details, a slightly different perspective. And that's the same when it comes to things like Wikipedia and encyclopedia, online encyclopedia. They cover the same, roughly the same range of info, um, although with some slight differences. So this means that if you do use any of these, um, you need to be selective in which ones you pick because you don't need five articles that all say basically the same thing. Now, popular science articles, these really aren't any different from the previous slide from uh, uh, general readership articles. Um, again, pop science journals like Psychology Today, Nature, they are written for a general audience, but, and, and so in doing so, they simplify their ideas, but since they're written for an audience that is more interested in science, that's specifically looking for information about this topic, and thus will have, on average, a higher level of scientific knowledge than the, the population at large, a popular science article will be more scientifically rigorous. And I'm only separating them out because the topic that I'm researching is a sci popular science topic. Um, similarly, if you're researching a musician, uh, popular music magazines would be a little bit more accurate in discussing music than a general audience newspaper. Uh, if you're reading, some, if you're investigating something, a historical event, uh, popular magazines that cater to history buffs are going to be more useful than, uh, again, general newspaper or uh, general readership articles from something like Time magazine on the same topic. The other nice thing about popular science articles, especially now that it's all published online, um, is they will often give you a link to the original scientific work. So even though they will dumb things down a little bit, you can look at the original uh, article that's, that was published by the original um, scientists quite often um, and read it for yourself. So you don't have to just rely on the simplified version written for the magazine. So as you are gathering your sources, um, it's useful to give them all uh, a kind of basic once over uh, in order to determine which ones you want to use, which ones just provide you information to, to research in other sources, and which ones you just want to discard altogether. So you want to understand for each one what the focus and perspective is. Um, so the focus and perspective of an article from a uh, science journal might be slightly different from one that's a journal mainly about current events and politics. So understanding that focus and perspective is, is very important so you can figure out if this is something that's, that's going to be useful for you. Um, as you look at the different sources, think about what kind of duplication or overlap there is between them. If an article is primarily just duplicates information that's from another source, then you probably don't need it. You can cut it out. 
Um, also thinking about their sophistication. The articles that are more sophisticated, more complex, give you more information and detail and nuance, those are gonna be better sources than ones that simplify things uh, to a greater degree. And finally, look for relevance. Um, just because something pops up in a search engine uh, or even because it has the, the name of your subject in its title doesn't mean it's all that relevant to your source. For example, as you'll see, some of the sources that I found, even though they were um, ostensibly about the Dunning-Kruger effect, they were really more about politics. So unless that was the way I wanted to take my research project, they weren't necessarily the most useful sources. And of course, uh, again, the thing to remember at this point is that some of these sources that you find, and actually many of the sources in these early stages, you won't really use uh, when you get to the end, depending on how developed uh, your research project uh, becomes, but you won't be using them in your final project. They are just stepping stones to get you to more sophisticated ideas, more complex uh, ideas, and more uh, in-depth sources. So what did I learn from Wikipedia? Uh, and this information was found also fairly similar um, on a couple of other internet encyclopedia. I learned that the Dunning-Kruger effect was developed by David Dunning and Justin Kruger, which tells me that I can look up other works by them. Now I know who they are, I know the kind of research that they do, uh, and I can see what else um, have they written. And the definition, this is taken directly from Wikipedia, which was a fairly clear definition and more uh, uh, thorough and more technical than the one that I started with. The Dunning-Kruger effect is a cognitive bias in which people of low ability have illusory superiority and mistakenly assess their cognitive ability as greater than it is. The cognitive bias of illusory superiority comes from the inability of low ability people to recognize their lack of ability. Without the self-awareness of metacognition, low ability people cannot objectively evaluate their competence or incompetence. Now, that's not necessarily the best written series of sentences, it could be made more clear, but it gives me um, a better idea of what, uh, a more specific idea of what the Dunning-Kruger effect is, and I've highlighted uh, and bolded a number of terms in red that I can investigate. What does cognitive bias mean? What does cognition mean? What does metacognition mean? These are concepts, technical concepts, that are obviously important to the Dunning-Kruger, to understanding the Dunning-Kruger effect, but uh, so if I, if I want to understand it and write about it, I need to be able to define these terms. I also found on the Wiki, Wikipedia page reference to a number of other studies after the original one in 1999, studies in 2003, 06, 08, and so on, some by the original authors, some by other researchers. Now that I know some of these studies, the people behind them, when they were published, I can investigate them and find out uh, how has this theory been uh, evaluated and further developed and further studied. Um, I learned that there is some controversy or debate about aspects of the theory that at least one study has uh, came to findings that were different from, that contradicted some aspects of the Dunning-Kruger uh, original study. So that tells me, okay, well now that's another area I can investigate. I can, under, I can investigate what the limits are of the theory, ways in which um, it might not be entirely accurate, ways in which it's been misunderstood and mis misapplied. So this is another area that I might address in my research project. And so now notice that, you know, I've, I found some good information from Wikipedia. It's given me some useful basics, but I'm not going to cite it in my final paper and I'm definitely not going to take any language from it to use in a research paper. Um, because again, it's, it's very basic, it's very simple, uh, but it gives me material, gives me ideas that I can investigate further. It helps me to discover other areas that I can investigate. And now I have a basic understanding of what the Dunning-Kruger effect is. I have a better definition and some better factual information. And this is information that you could, would be supported. Uh, you could verify with by looking in a number of other um, sources. You could investigate the original studies and confirm all of these facts. So this isn't really stuff that's, that's super important um, and not, not material that would necessarily make it, again, to your final research paper. 
So what did I learn from some of the news sources that I found? Uh, and I'm just going to give you a, a basic overview of these. So on Forbes, I found an article called The Dunning-Kruger Effect Shows Why Some People Think They're Great Even When Their Work Is Terrible. And you can click on that title to, to go to the article yourself. And as an overview, what it does is it explains what the theory is in basic terms. It gives some examples of the effect in action from um, work and life that is scenes in that many people would be familiar with from their own experiences um, that show the Dunning-Kruger effect uh, operating, show people overestimating their abilities. And it gives some statistics from uh, businesses and from some universities about the self-perceptions of their employees uh, when it comes to their confidence, uh, excuse me, competence. So I might cite this article in a research paper, but it's pretty simple, it's pretty basic. The theory, um, the examples are very basic. I could get better terms, better definitions from the original source, uh, certainly from more rigorous scientific articles, but the statistics are useful because it shows um, that's, a, that's a good way to demonstrate that there is an, an effect present. Um, so it, it demonstrates that this thing is happening. Um, so those are useful statistics. That's something that might make it to my research paper ultimately. On the Washington Post, I found another source called uh, What's Behind the Confidence of the Incompetent? This Suddenly Popular Psychological Phenomenon. So again, this explains the theory in basic terms, almost identical to what was um, in the Forbes article. And it makes a connection to current events, um, using uses this to uh, try to understand Donald Trump and his claims, various claims of his expertise in all sorts of subjects. And it talks about how, um, again, particularly because of Donald Trump's uh, election, um, that there's been a great deal of popular interest in this theory. So this one, I might use it in a research paper, but it doesn't really, it didn't really tell me a lot of new information about the theory, it didn't give me any details, anything that I didn't already know. The only thing that's useful about it is if I wanted to demonstrate that people are interested in the theory and I wanted to, to tie it to current events. If I wanted to show, hey, this theory is something that people are, are using right now to explain politics, that might be an interesting point to make. But I wouldn't cite it when it comes to, I wouldn't use it or cite it when it comes to actually defining what the Dunning-Kruger effect is or how it works. On a website called Ars Technica, which is a, a pop science uh, paper, um, it has an article, it's titled Revisiting Why Incompetents Think They're Awesome. And again, you can link to it. Um, and it's a much more detailed explanation of the, of the theory. This article was oh, roughly three to four times as long as either of the previous two articles. Um, and that's because this is a pop science publication. So even though it's for a general readership, it's for readers who have a greater interest and knowledge and uh, uh, of science. And also very useful is it provided link to the original scientific papers. So uh, at some point, I'm going to want to go and look at those. Um, now I know I have at least one place that I can that I know where to find them. Um, so that's very useful because it doesn't just give me the uh, uh, journalist's version of things. It allows me to compare what the journalist says to the original scientific paper to whatever extent that I'm able to understand it. So this one, out of the ones I've found, um, it's much more likely to use to be useful in a research paper because it gives a much more thorough explanation of the phenomenon. So I might actually use language, I might actually quote and cite this article when it comes to defining and explaining what the Dunning-Kruger effect is. And it also provides me with a whole lot more uh, related terms to investigate. So this is a very useful source. And again, you can click on the, uh, the link to take, it, take yourself to it if you're, if you're interested. And I found another source. This is another pop science um, journal, Psychology Today. And it had a number of articles on the Dunning-Kruger effect, but the one I, I chose to, to talk about is this one called The Dunning-Kruger President. How did a psychology term become a partisan trending topic? Um, this one, even though it's from a pop science publication, this was a very basic explanation of the theory. It might have been the most simplistic 
overall, even more simplistic than the Forbes and Washington Post articles. And it really, the only thing uh, about it is it's talks about how the theory has become a popular way for some people to explain Trump's popularity and his election, people who are opposed to Trump, obviously. Um, because of the simplicity, because it's pretty basic, I probably wouldn't use this source. It's very brief. Even though it does mention contemporary interest in the theory, it doesn't provide anything new or useful. It's If I really wanted to, to um, talk about the the use of the theory in current political discussion, I would use the article that I found um, a couple slides back. So this was not a very useful resource. There were other articles from Psychology Today that, that might have been useful, but this particular one wasn't. So my initial source, and again, I didn't go through it just for purposes of time, but um, there are, of course, many other sources, um, personal sources, other news sites, many of which covered similar topics as those already mentioned. As I was going through them, I saw that many of them were, again, fairly identical. So I picked out a couple of ones that seemed to be the most thorough, the most reliable, the most current something that was published in July of 2017 uh, is probably going to be uh, better, at least more current um, in some ways, in most ways, than something published in 2002. So I didn't show you everything that I found, but a lot of it was just the same basic stuff. Further searches. As you continue to find sources, you'll find that there's a range of issues within your topic. So use that information to help you um, further refine your search. So these are additional search terms beyond the ones that you already generated, like um, history or controversy or whatever it might have been. Dunning-Kruger plus politics, Dunning-Kruger plus business. Um, so as you start to see how people are talking about your topic, use their perspectives, use their ideas to help you find more information to help you refine your search. You might discover, oh, hey, you know, I am really interested in the way the Dunning-Kruger effect operates in the business world. And so you decide to focus on that, focus on the terms, the ideas, the phrases that you find in business-oriented sources to help you continue to go down that avenue. All right, let's close out this uh, presentation by talking about how you can build an outline. And I'll go through building a very basic, simple outline uh, based on the ideas that I've been looking at for the Dunning-Kruger effect. If I were to be writing um, a simple uh, first stage research paper like the ones um, my students will be writing uh, uh, in the coming weeks. So you want to decide on what the basic topics that you want and need to address. And this is going to be different depending on, on the topic. Um, if you're writing about a person versus a historical event versus a scientific concept versus a location, um, the, what the basics are, what the things are that you need to address in order to explain um, the, the topic to your audience, uh, give them an idea of what it is, define it, have, help them to understand its significance. Those are going to be different for every topic. And once you've decided on what the ideas are that you need to get across, you want to think about how you're going to arrange them in some sort of logical order. So on the one hand, that order, there's a chronology, basically, um, mean, meaning that there's a, a, a sequence. What's the order that you're going to put them in? Um, and then also think about the hierarchy between the ideas. Some ideas are... are bigger, so to speak, than others. There are some that are main categories and some ideas that are really subsets of these. So think about how the ideas, not only how they relate to each other in terms of sequence, but how they relate to each other in terms of importance or hierarchy. 
So here's the very simple, um, the beginning of the very simple outline that I have come up with. Uh, my introduction, I need to introduce my idea of the Dunning-Kruger effect, or introduce what it is. Um, and I also need to give the reader some sense of my focus. Am I going to be talking about the Dunning-Kruger effect, particularly as a psychological phenomenon? Am I going to be talking about it um, as a uh, its relevance to politics? Am I going to be talking about it its relevance to business? Um, that's something that needs to be set by my introduction. At this point, I'm not quite sure yet, so I'm leaving it vague. Then the next section of the paper, which is not next necessarily a single paragraph, but the next chunk, um, is where I want to define the Dunning-Kruger effect, right? If it's a paper about that, for people who don't really know what it is, I need to begin by defining it. So I want to explain the concept in detail, define any key terms, terms like cognitive ability, metacognition, and some of the possible sources I might use and cite in this section of the paper would be perhaps the original study itself, as well as the pop sci science articles that I found, specifically that Ars Technica article. Um, those would be useful for accomplishing what I need to accomplish in this section of the paper. The next section of the paper will be the development of the Dunning-Kruger effect, the development of the theory. So I might provide uh, begin by providing an overview of Dunning and Kruger, who they are, what their what their background is, what they what they study, um, and then I would want to explain what their initial research is. Uh, look at possible sources uh, here again, the original study, looking for the professional websites of Dunning and Kruger, and again other pop science articles. So when I say possible sources, I mean, I'm meaning what are the what are the sources out of all the things that I found, which ones can I use uh, to help me accomplish these tasks? And as, as you're building an outline, this is a very basic one so far, this is just two levels, you can go further, you can get further, further uh, more detailed and start to insert more specific concepts as your outline grows and as your ideas develop. The next section of the paper will be the demonstration of the Dunning-Kruger effect. So I'll have some examples of the Dunning-Kruger effect, and if this were a more detailed outline, as I was just discussing, um, under examples of the Dunning-Kruger effect, I could have examples in the business world, examples in education, examples in politics. Um, I could then talk about current interest in the Dunning-Kruger effect. Why are people interested in it? What's the um, significance of this effect to modern culture, to my readers? Why is this important? So what are some possible sources that I could use in this part of the paper? Articles with statistics, other studies demonstrating the Dunning-Kruger effect, maybe perhaps some of the articles about Dunning-Kruger and Trump, if that's the way I decide to go. Um, these are some of the things that would help me, again, accomplish those goals. The next section will be on controversies and debates. So I want to look at gaps in the theory, what are some, some things that perhaps the theory doesn't account for, or questions that, that the theory, uh, that haven't been answered about the theory. I also uh, would want to look at the studies that conflict with the Dunning, the original Dunning-Kruger study. Um, so again, what are my possible sources, scientific studies, pop science articles, and so forth. Um, finally, my conclusion. In the conclusion of your of the essay, what am I going to do? Well, of course, I want to recap the main points. Um, here is where I, I really dig into the significance of the Dunning-Kruger effect. Why is this important for my reader to know? Why should they be interested in understanding what this concept is and, and its relevance to, to their lives? And also, I could talk about lingering questions, possible future areas for research. So these last two slides, just a very basic outline. Again, we can get more detailed. We could start getting further in um, instead of just having two levels, having three, four levels of, of content. So under gaps in the theory, there might be a few different type of gaps. Um, and that's where I would, uh, as I make a more detailed outline, start to insert the ideas, the um, information that I'm finding into this outline and perhaps even revising it some, rearranging things as my research continues.
All right, now let me just finish up this presentation uh, with the next steps for you. Um, so the next step, especially and, and depending on where you are in the, pro the process of research, you might be further along. Uh, some people are further along than others. First, you want to generate your questions and key terms. And again, I've given you a very basic example of how to do that here. We've talked a little bit about that in class and in the library sessions that you've had. So generate those things that are going to help you specify what is it that you want to know about this subject? What are you going to look for? Use those terms to help you find sources. If you're at this point, you might just be using doing basic internet search, um, using something like Google um, as you get further into the project, you start looking, you'll start looking in a uh, library database for more sophisticated sources. But at this point, you know, using something like Google is fine. Um, but just don't pick the first four things that come up. Remember to evaluate them, look for sources that seem to be the most reliable, the most credible, the most substantive, um, the most detailed that give you the best information that you can find. As you're looking through those sources, um, identify the key ideas and information that they're providing. Um, identify what it is that you're learning that's that's important. Um, and that will, again, also to help you determine which of the sources are most useful and which ones you can leave behind. And then determine the ideas you want to communicate. Organize those into an outline. Now that you know, OK, these are the, the most important topics uh, within the subject that I'm researching. Um, the, uh, in the example that I gave, the development, um, the, the demonstration of it in, in uh, effect, uh, controversies related to it. What are those ideas? Think about how they relate to each other, both in terms of sequence and in terms of importance, and use that to help you generate an outline. And with that outline, you can actually start drafting. Many people don't Many people start drafting before they've written an outline, and of course that's fine, but I do think it helps, even if you've already started to write, organizing your thoughts into an outline, use that to help you get launched on the process of actually writing your paper. So with that, I will end this presentation. I hope that it has been helpful, uh, at least in some way. If you have any questions, uh, please email me or come to my office hours, contact me um, in some other way that you know how. Otherwise, I wish you the day you wish yourselves, and I look forward to seeing you in the next lecture.